The Houston Rockets shutting down their vets for the rest of the NBA season. No more Eric Gordon, Dennis Schroeder, or Christian Wood. Jalen Green showing exactly why he is going to be a future superstar in today's NBA. Kevin Porter Jr. and Josh Christopher also joining hands with Jalen Green to have some really impressive nights going toe-to-toe with the San Antonio Spurs, vying for a play-in spot, coming up just short on a final last second shot by KJ Martin that rimmed in not once but twice and found its way out of the rim. We're going to break it all down for you coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another episode of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and also host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. Now, today's episode is brought to you by NBA Top Shot. NBA Top Shot is the future of being an NBA Fan, own officially licensed rare NFTs of the greatest moments from NBA history. Sign up today at LockedOn.NBATopShot.com. What a game between the Houston Rockets and the San Antonio Spurs. Rockets falling 123-120. Almost the perfect game if you're at this point in the season. If you're the Houston Rockets, largely competitive. We saw Jalen Green, Kevin Porter Jr., Josh Christopher all ball out in this one. And they came up just a little bit short. Kevin Porter Jr. after the game saying that the game gods didn't want them to win this one. But oh boy, were the Tankathon gods looking out for the Houston Rockets. K.J. Martin's three ball just coming up a little bit short in the final seconds of this game. Bounced off the backboard and then swirled around the rim not once but twice and then found its way going out. KJ was in disbelief when he sat down at the mic post game. He was like, I don't know how it didn't go in. Like that was his first words. And he took it really hard walking away from the floor. Just, you know, it was one of those games where you look at that shot and you're like, it's tough. But all that to be said, a lot to unpack from this one. Jalen Green proving exactly why he is going to be a superstar in the NBA. Kevin Porter Jr. and Josh Christopher with some electric play. Alperin Shingun gets another start in place of Christian Wood. We'll talk about his production. Usman Garuba and Dacian Nix getting legitimate rotation minutes with the shortened rotation with the veterans no longer ahead of them in the pecking order. We're going to get into all of that as well as the Tankathon pick watch and a very, very important game, uh, a very important win from the Oklahoma City Thunder. Shout out to Houston legend now Isaiah Roby and uh, Aaron Wiggins, a pair of Houston legends for helping the Rockets out in that department. But let's focus here on Jalen Green because Jalen Green had an absurd performance in this game, finished the night with 30 points on 10 of 24 shooting. The efficiency kind of waned a little bit in the fourth quarter of this game. He went into the fourth quarter shooting, I believe, 9 of 18 for the game. So that was a a bit more of an efficient evening rolling into the final frame. But 10 of 24 shooting on the evening, 6 of 15 from behind the three-point line. He had four rebounds, four assists, had a block, just a couple of turnovers. And a few things really stood out about Jalen Green to me in this one. One, he... His shot has become, it's starting to look so pure now. Like it's just when Jalen Green pulls the trigger on a three, I feel like it's going in more oftentimes than not at this point. Like it doesn't really like, I mean, earlier this season, you know, he would go through these stretches where you're just like, oh, he can't buy a three ball. And and now it's like, I feel like every time he pulls the trigger, I'm like, I feel pretty good about this ball going in. Like he's turned into a pretty reliable three point shooter as the season has gone on. And then not only that, but he has these moments where you, these, these glimpses into what he's going to be like, you know, a year, two, three, five years down the line, again, flashes of superstardom, right? Had the poster on Jakob Pertl was absolutely bananas. The way that he cut through the defense, got the pass and then elevated, you know, like instantaneously, as soon as he, I don't even think he had the ball like in his hands before he started his upwards jump elevated through the air. I mean, the, the 
the kid is flying when he jumps and just completely posterized Jakob Pertl was absolutely filthy. You're not going to see Devin Booker or Bradley Beal doing that. I'm sorry. And then later in the game, as the Rockets were trailing big at the end of the third quarter to give the Rockets a bit of momentum heading into the fourth, Jalen Green dribbles up the length of the court, pulls up from the right wing and drains a three-pointer to give the Rockets momentum going into the fourth quarter in front of not one, but two, two Spurs defenders. The, the level of difficulty of some of the plays that he's able to make right now in his rookie season is absurd to see how much more comfortable he is with the ball in his hands, kind of navigating defenses and creating for himself and attacking and all of that. And then not only that, but a point that I brought up last episode was the fact that Jalen Green has really felt like he's developed and become more comfortable operating off ball too, right? And maybe that's, you know, credit to the coaching staff for having him be off ball, you know, and have moments where he was off ball throughout the season so that he's not, you know, alien to that level of, of having to move and relocate when he doesn't have the ball in his hands. I had a chance to ask Steven Silas about it pregame, and Steven Silas said they call that finding windows. And he actually, you know, alluded to a play that took place against the Portland Trailblazers where Jalen had cut in from the bait from the weak side baseline as Scoot was driving the ball in, kind of making his move. And there wasn't anything there on the initial cut, like maybe the lob pass or something, but there wasn't anything there. And he continued on around the baseline, got to the strong side corner. And as Scoot was making his move, driving in Jalen Green's defender had peeled off to help on the drive. And so Scoot was able to hit Jalen in the corner for the wide open three. So it's those opportunities, those moments where Jalen is moving and relocating without the basketball, be it even if he's just drifting from like, you know, the top of the key over into one, you know, over to the right wing or the left wing as a play is developing and finding those little gaps to be successful. And it's just a, it's like a breath of fresh air after years of James Harden, you know, basically being like, you know, in cement shoes like on the floor and not moving if he didn't have the basketball in his hands, just very much floating around like almost the half court margin, top of the key area to see a young budding superstar player in Jalen green being willing to relocate without the basketball and, and being willing to allow others to help create offense for him. I feel like in James Harden's last couple seasons in Houston, legitimately, I, I feel like there was almost a, like, it was almost impossible for his teammates to create opportunities for him because even when he did have wide open shots, he would almost hesitate, right, to take those shots. He would like take like a rhythm dribble and sometimes the defender would close out in time before he just got the shot up. And it was just kind of a weird, you know, identity that he had developed, you know, in these last like in this last season or two in Houston, whereas in his earlier career in Houston, other guys could create for him and he'd do just fine. But I don't want to get too much down too much of a rabbit hole here. I do want to focus on Jalen Green because I do think he had an absolute standout performance. Now leads all rookies in 30 point games, play 30 point games scored this season. You don't see Cade Cunningham with 30 burgers. You don't see Evan Mobley with 30 burgers. You're not seeing Scotty Barnes do that. Jalen Green is now leading the pack. He's going to be a bona fide future NBA scoring champion. Absolutely, he's going to have a scoring title at some point in his career, NBA career, probably multiple of them. But even past the scoring, the defense. He had a couple possessions late in this one to force turnovers from the San Antonio Spurs to give the Rockets chances late in this game. And seeing that level of commitment on the ball, he had one where he forced a turnover from DeJounte Murray, and then he had another one, and I think it might, I think it actually was DeJounte Murray a second time, who was driving in and forced the offensive foul, forced the off-arm shove. And it's that level of like peskiness, hounding the ball, commitment to playing defense that is going to make Jalen Green truly a, a superstar talent, not just because of the entire offensive bag, but his willingness to commit to the entire game as a whole. The fundamentals are there. The willingness, the drive to be the best on both ends is there. And the sky's the limit for Jalen Green. So I walk away super ecstatic about this game. We're going to talk about the other storylines from this one. Josh Christopher with his impressive night off the bench. Alperen Shingun getting the starting nod in place of Christian Wood. Dacian Nix and Usman Garuba looking really solid in their rotation minutes off the bench in this one, as well as checking in on the Tankathon standings because it's that time of year, so we absolutely have to do that. But... 
first, we have a quick message from our friends over at NBA Top Shot because NBA Top Shot is the officially licensed NFT of the NBA. You can connect with a passionate community of NBA fans across the globe and build your collection with your favorite moments from NBA history. NBA Top Shot is the future of what being an NBA fan looks like. It's part trading cards, part stock market, and part fantasy sports with a built-in loyalty program. NBA Top Shot has evolved trading cards and made it easier to buy, sell, and trade by removing the hassle of card grading, shoeboxes, and binders. They're 24 24- seven peer-to-peer marketplace lets you scroll through all of your favorite players and teams once you find the moment that you've been looking for you can buy it in just a couple of clicks owning nba top shot moments can even get you access to unbuyable once in a lifetime experiences for example last year nba top shot flew out a group of fans to phoenix for game five of the nba finals just for having phoenix suns moments in their collection the following week nba top shot flew out a group of fans to new york for the nba draft and these collectors got to have dinner with four future first round picks the night before they were drafted if you sign up for nba top shot today the best way to start is getting yourself a starter pack you can pull a moment of a superstar like lebron or KD or star rookies like Jalen green so do it you can go go check out the starter pack it's only nine dollars head over to lockedon.nbatopshot.com to start building your collection today and another message from our friends over at Truebill. Because do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your hard-earned money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions so hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts, and Truebill will cancel your unwatched subscriptions in one tap, one click, one button press. It is that easy easy. Don't fall for any more subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash locked on NBA. Go right now. That's truebill.com slash locked on NBA. It could save you thousands a year. Again, that's truebill.com slash locked on NBA. And continuing on here at locked on rockets, your daily podcast home for everything. Houston rockets basketball. Let's continue on with this Rockets Spurs game on the Spurs side of things. DeJounte Murray had such an impressive performance, 33 points, 11 of 18 shooting two of five from three, nine of 12 from the free throw line had seven rebounds, 11 assists, two steals, two blocks, just an absolutely absurd performance from DeJounte Murray. When I watch Murray play, it it makes me think of like a controlled Russell Westbrook is kind of what is, is almost what I see like in the games that I've watched him play. Maybe that's completely off base. I don't know. Like it's, it's Russell Westbrook with proper structure is, is what I'm like looking at, but uh, I'm glad that he got the all-star now this season. Murray is an incredible player. And I thought it was kind of funny early in this game. Jay Sean Tate uh, kind of got into it with Jante Murray a little bit, kind of bodied him going for maybe a steal or, or what have you. And uh, Dejounte Murray took exception to that. Tate tried to like help him up off the floor, and Murray like completely like ignored his you know his you know offer to pull him up off the ground, and even had some words for him when he got back up. The refs reviewed the play, looking for a hostile act, and nothing there. Come, come and foul, play on. But I thought it was very big brain of Jay Sean Tate to <laughs> poke the bear that was Dejounte Murray, so that he would have a masterclass performance against the Rockets, therefore ensuring the tank. So Jay Sean Tate, a covert tanking operative, uh, you know, being deployed by the front office. No, I kid, I kid. But uh, from this game on the Rocket side of things, Alper and Shingun getting the start in place of Christian Wood, Garrison Matthews as per normal when Eric Gordon does not play, getting the start in place of him. And LP had just a really solid game across the board. You know, not like a masterclass performance, nothing crazy home, crazy to you know write home about. Uh, but finished with 12 points, three of 10 shooting is not great. Uh, you'd like to see that number be a, a little bit better, just one of five inside, you know. And, and that's kind of a bit, maybe not necessarily a concerning trend, but there are some moments where Alpi has some bunnies that he misses, but sometimes those numbers do uh, add up for him when he's just trying to like tip a ball back in, he'll get credited with like a tip shot. And those aren't exactly like controlled shots. So I, I think, you know, the inefficiency of his box scores can sometimes be a little bit misleading, especially when you consider how efficient of a player he actually is, you know, as far as just his ability to get to the free throw line, his ability to get work done inside all of that. Um, the two of five, three point shooting is nice. I do like to see him, you know, making those attempts to try and shoot the three ball rather than passing up those opportunities and shooting 40% is great. So love that out of him Four four free throw shooting, the seven boards, three assists, had two blocks and had like, he had four turnovers because sometimes LP does a little bit too much with the basketball. That's understandable. Um, sometimes there's some ill-advised passes there, but that's just kind of one of those things like you live with, right? When you've got that level, that caliber of player, again, very Manu Ginobili-esque, Steph Curry-esque, it just their level of 
kind of erratic highlight level play because to get those highlight level moments, you got to give them a bit of leash to just let them play their style. Right. And it's, you live with those moments because then it'll deliver you moments like the insane behind the back bounce pass that he had to a cutting Jay Sean Tate. Don't even know how he saw Jay Sean Tate approaching the rim, but Al P was posted up. Jay Sean comes cutting in from the weak side and just a beautifully delivered behind the back bounce pass. Your nightly Alper and Shingun highlight reel uh, assist was really absurd. And he didn't get to finish this game because Steven Silas opted to go with the closing lineup of, of KJ Martin and Jay Sean Tate. And I don't think that's absolutely like the end of the world. Um, I do like the momentum that Steven Silas had with the closing lineup that he had out on the floor. Uh, that said, Alper and Shingun got plenty of run in this game and we'll get plenty of run across the remaining six games of the season, assuming he's going to be starting every single one of those. Hopefully we're in for another, you know, game or two where we see Alper and Shingun have some career nights again, like he did against the Portland trailblazers. But let's talk a little bit about KPJ and Josh Christopher in this one as well. Kevin Porter Jr. continues to just show that he is just talented across the board. Like, I'm sorry, it's the talent has never been in question with KPJ. It's about being able to get that consistently out there on the floor. And in this one felt like he had a really solid game. I mean, 26 points, nine rebounds, seven assists, one steal, one block, only one turnover, just doing a little bit of everything. Nine of 22 shooting. Again, I think his shooting numbers too kind of waned a little bit there in the fourth quarter uh, as things tightened up a little bit for the Spurs, but just a really impressive game from him. Had some good defensive possessions and, in this one, it felt like he got to the rim a little bit more successfully than he has in, in recent weeks and in the recent, you know, this recent stretch of the season. And that's been a bit of a concerning trend with KPJ is the three ball has been falling, which is great. Like the three point shot has been his bread and butter. It's been consistent. He's, you know, completely revamped and worked on that side of his game. He is, I believe, fourth in the NBA and catch and shoot three point opportunities. How somewhere around like 46%, which is absolutely absurd to think about the fact that he's gotten to that point and is basically a like phenomenal three and D player. When you think about it with the strides that he's made defensively and with the, you know, his ability to hit wide open three point shots that said, you know, what makes him such a dynamic player is his ability to get to the rim and score at will, right? And and force the defense's hand that way and kind of create for his teammates by leveraging his scoring gravity. And we haven't really seen him effectively score at the rim, it feels like, in a while. And I think a big part of that is I don't think he's playing at 100%. You know, maybe it's just, you know, some minor nagging injuries here and there, and it's nothing that's going to hold him out of a game. But I think there are some, some, maybe some lingering things that are keeping him from, you know, going a hundred and, you know, 105, 110% at the rim, trying to finish with, you know, that level of aggression. And on top of that, sometimes when he drives, he shies away from contact, right? Like that's the thing is we see Jalen Green as the season has gone along, learning more to lean into and force contact and create contact when getting to the rim. Whereas, KPJ has a tendency to like get to the rim and try to like elevate and have those little like fall away jump shots and fall away, you know, layups and whatnot, trying to avoid the contact or finesse his way out of it. And I think that that's not necessarily the right progression for his game. I'd like to see him be a little bit more assertive when he does drive to the basket, but I can't complain too much. He had a really strong performance across the board. And again, the, the assist numbers, we, again, the seven assists to just the one turnover is a great sign to see uh, from, you know, from him. And then off the bench, the third guard in the Rockets rotation, basically coming off the bench and sparking that six man role in this game, Josh Christopher, who it was just absurd in this one. 20 points on six of 10 shooting was one of two from the three point line, seven of seven. He was a team high, seven free throw attempts and seven makes at the free throw line. Uh, had six rebounds, had six assists, had two steals, had a block, just two turnovers. I mean, this might honestly be Josh Christopher's best game of the season, honestly. And I think that when you look at what his production can bring, I got the chance to ask him about what it's like playing alongside Jalen and Kevin Porter Jr. And he said that it, for him, it frees him up to be a little bit more focused defensively and kind of to be that disruptor, right? To focus on, you know, crashing the glass, getting rebounds, you know, playing strong defense. He had that one defense or that one offensive possession where he's able to crash the glass late and get, you know, and score the basket that way. So it's like, you know, having those opportunities for him where he's not necessarily one of the two guards on the floor and he's more, you know, a more of a wing player playing alongside Jalen and KPJ gets him to, you know, get some different looks for him, lets him kind of do some things, but he's also self-aware. Like 
Ja, even though he had six assists and just two turnovers in this game, when asked about what he's looking to improve, Josh said, I think I can tunnel vision at times. Like, I think, you know, sometimes I tunnel vision a little bit too much, like on my drives. And I think Josh is might, might be one of my favorite interviews, like on the entire team, because he's so open with when he's discussing his game and how he impacts, you know, the flow of things on a day or on a night to night basis. And again, I wanted to see more minutes for Jacob. Jalen and KPJ together. And it feels like we're going to get a lot of those as the season winds down. And Hey, I, I, at this point, I also wouldn't necessarily be shocked if Jacob maybe gets thrown into the starting lineup for a game or two to wrap things up just because Garrison Matthews has had a very concerning stretch of play for lack of better terminology. Um, I don't want to make too much out of Gary Bird's play, but I do want to revisit that topic here at the top of the final segment, as well as the play from Dacian Nix and Usman Garuba. Uh, KJ Martin continues to have some really impressive uh, moments and continues to, you know, make his claim for being a starter on this Rockets team. We're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at Rock Auto. Dot com Because look, with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's basically impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. Why endure the often pointless or seemingly intimidating question like, is your car an LX or an EX? All that stuff, right? You can save time and money when you use rockauto.com. Why choose to spend 30, 50, or even 100% more for the exact same auto parts from a chain store or car dealership? Here's a quick example. A Honda Odyssey fuel pump costs $353 from a chain store. It's only $216 from rockauto.com. And best of all, Rock Auto is a family business. They've been serving do-it-yourselfers online for over 20 years. The prices are always reliably low for every single customer. They've got everything you can imagine from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even brand new carpet. So go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution for your auto parts needs. And here's the really important part. When you go to check out on their website, be sure to write Locked On in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Be sure to visit rockauto.com. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, let's talk a little bit about the additions of... Usman Garuba and Dacian Nix into like the actual Rockets rotation. And I, I want to push back a little bit too, because I, I've seen a lot of frustration regarding like Usman Garuba this season specifically. And I think that there's plenty of fair criticisms to be had of Steven Silas up and down the board. Sure. But a lack of minutes for Usman Garuba shouldn't be one of them. I think because when you consider kind of, how this season progressed and where where things went with the fact that the Rockets largely thought their two bigs in their rotation were going to be Christian Wood and Daniel Tice, and Alper and Shingun was going to be kind of the project big, right? Like they knew what they had with him, sort of, but they didn't expect him to be so good so quickly. And so that actually, they they made the move to get rid of Daniel Tice because of how good Alper and Shingun was. And so not only was Usman Garuba the fourth big buried at the end of the bench in a team that was dominated by tons of guards. You got to remember Armani Brooks was on this team earlier this season as well. Like this Rockets team had a lot of depth to it and you can only have 12 active players each each game, right? So what were the Rockets supposed to do? Were the Rockets supposed to have four, one third of their active players were supposed to be centers just on the off chance that Usman Garuba was going to get some garbage time at the very, very, very tail end of a game? Come on, really? Like, I, that's that's my point. That's all I want to hammer home here is just, like, Usman Garuba wa did, wasn't going to get the garbage time earlier this season. They did send him down to RGV. That's what they wanted to do. That was always the plan with Josh Christopher and Usman Garuba was for them to get the reps with RGV. Then Usman Garuba had his hand injury, unfortunately, had to rehab that, get back up to game speed. And now we're seeing it in a position where he's able to, you know, soak up at least a little bit of rotation minutes the tail end of the season. Usman Garuba was always going to be the project player for this Houston Rockets team, because yes, he has a ton of potential on the defensive side of the basketball. And he's arguably one of the best, you know, like Rafael Stone said, right? The best defender in the world, not in the NBA. That's great. He's hyping up his guy. That said, the offensive game was so raw, so unpolished when he came in that he needed some time to get that to a better level. And now it's, it's, you know, significantly better. Like now he's got a more reliable looking three point shot. Josh Christopher talking after the game, uh, about Usman Garuba's three-point shot. He said, Uzi's three-point shot is believable now for sure. He's worked a lot on that since the beginning of the season, which is great because now we are absolutely going to start calling Usman Garuba Uzi, which is uh, like I've heard Steven Silem call him Us. And, and so that I think that's another nickname. So we've got 
And we've got a ton of nicknames for Usmo Groove. We've got Us, we've got Uzi, and we've got La Pantera, which was his nickname uh, overseas, the Panther. So just there's a lot of different ways we can go with Usmo Groove. But he's, you know, continues to look really impressive in the glimpses that we've had of him on the floor. I think the defensive awareness is definitely something that's worthwhile. And Steven Silas was, was very, uh, very complimentary of of Usman Garuba and kind of the vision that this Rockets team has for him moving forward. They, they value him. They think very highly of him and they want him to understand that he has a role on this team and that they have high hopes for him moving forward. So hopefully this end of the season can be kind of a glimpse into the next chapter for Usman Garuba for next season. And maybe that's something to take into consideration. If the Rockets really think that they have something there with Usman Garuba, then Maybe that possibly impacts their decision-making at the top of the draft and whether or not they decide they think they need another big or they want somebody more in the wing guard mold. I don't know. Again, you take best player available. That's always my argument. But uh, it's just worth noting that the Rockets are incredibly high on Usman Garuba, and he continues to you know, have some really impressive moments in the floor uh, on the floor when he's out there, as well as Dacian Nix, who you know, doesn't, you know, hasn't gotten a ton of minutes, but when, in the reps that he does get, He's a good decision maker offensively, right? He makes good, good, clean passes, makes the right reads. Um, he very much is like a traditional point guard. And it's kind of like, it's a very weird change of pace to have that out on the floor compared to a Kevin Porter Jr. or a Josh Christopher or somebody else handling the rock because Dacian does very much like observe the floor in, in a traditional point guard capacity. Even Dennis Schroeder is, you know, very much more a traditional point guard compared to some of the other guys that I just named off. But Dennis Schroeder is also like, you know, he's a score first type point guard, not necessarily, not necessarily a traditional point guard. He's just a vet, like an NBA veteran point guard. So he understands how to get guys in their spots and how to have them be successful. But with Dejan Nix, the one thing that I've started to kind of notice defensively with him, and maybe this is my one area of concern for him is like, the lateral quickness is just not necessarily there against some of the quicker, like twitchier guards. Um, kind of getting beat off the bounce a lot, like a concerning amount. Now he's got like a strong upper body. And so, you know, it, it, it conversely, like I've seen him be, be switched on to bigger players and not give like an inch of ground because he's, he's built like, you know, like a mini fridge. Hey, I can't say mini fridge refrigerator. Yeah. I can't call him a mini fridge. That's just rude. So anyways, Dacia Nix is built, right? Like the guy's got some, some muscle to him. And so, Maybe that's one of the trade-offs, right? Is that he's a bigger, stronger guard, and that's something that we haven't necessarily seen him like utilize offensively, right? Maybe seeing him like posting up some smaller guards would be an interesting dynamic for him offensively, kind of creating out of the low post, a la like, you know, we've seen Chris Paul make passes out of the low post, you know, historically for the Rockets, and that's always a fun little wrinkle to their offensive sets. But um, with Dacia Nix, he just continues to show that there's something there. I don't know if it's going to be a starting caliber, something, some, you know, down the line. I don't know if it's going to be a rotational player down the line, but there's something there for sure. And having these moments at the end of the season, now that it looks like the vets are going to be shut down for these final six, seven games allows the Rockets to take a closer look at what they have with him. Uh, and final, just last thought here to chime in on KJ Martin. Uh, KJ hit a big three to close things out right in the final moments of that game to pull the Rockets closer to the San Antonio Spurs. And, you know, for him to be in the position to be attempting to be even thinking about attempting a game tying overtime, forcing three pointer and to have it rim out the way that it did. I know it went glass, which is like kind of whatever, but like to see him have that moment, right. Where he put the ball on the deck and, and, and took the sidestep dribble and, and got the shot up. Like, I don't know if that's something that necessarily like he one would be in the position to do last season two would be comfortable doing like it, I think it just it speaks to his growth as a three point shooter like and the fact that he was very confident in taking that shot and the fact that his teammates were confident in him taking that shot I know the play was kind of you know it was kind of a broken play he was looking you know for a dribble hand you know for a dribble handoff opportunity or for a, just a handoff to the, to either Jalen or KPJ and it just wasn't there so he spun and and you know got the step on his defender and got the shot up. But to be talking about these moments and this growth and this development from KJ Martin, from a shooting perspective, you know, he makes all the sense in the world moving forward as the Rockets started, because he just opens things up for the rest of the guys on the floor and the chemistry that he's developed with Alper and Shingun across the season, the chemistry that he's developed with Jalen green and KPJ this season. Um, he's the future, like, 
at the four at the three four spot for this Houston Rockets team. I truly believe that unless they go um not even in less, right? Because I I mean the idea of like rolling out a starting lineup next season of Jalen Green, Kevin Porter Jr., KJ Martin, Jabari Smith, and Alper and Shingoon, or even if you're not on the Jabari jungle, right? Like Bancaro or Chet Holmgren in that four spot next to Shingoon, like that is a really exciting, enticing lineup because you've got an insane amount of athleticism. You can run, you've got playmaking across the board. You've got guys who are just freak athletes. Like I, I would be stoked if that was the Rockets lineup, any variation of that lineup for the Houston Rockets next season. But with that, I do want to check in on the Tankathon uh, situation because Oklahoma City won a magical game against the Portland Trailblazers. Despite their tanking efforts, Sam Presti's probably going to like shut down Isaiah Roby and Aaron Wiggins for the rest of the season because the Thunder won 134-131 against the Portland Trailblazers. A storybook Cinderella ending for the OKC Thunder in overtime against the Blazers, a Blazers team that this Rockets just picked up two wins against. So you know Sam Presti is sitting somewhere fuming that the that the Thunder picked up this dub. Uh, Isaiah Roby walking away with like 30 points in this game. Aaron Wiggins was like 26, 28 points or something. Uh, Houston legends, those two guys. And so the updated uh, Tankathon lottery simulation at this point, Detroit is still 20 and 55. Uh, the Rockets are tied 20 and 56 with Orlando for the worst record in the association. And now OKC is a couple losses out or sorry, three losses away from the Rockets and up two wins. Uh, I don't think OKC is going to be catching up to Houston in the tankathon race. So really it's, it looks like a three man race between the Rockets, the magic and the Pistons. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and run a quick tankathon sim. Now, unfortunately, Charlotte did lose another game. So now Charlotte is back in the lottery. The Brooklyn Nets are out of the lottery, which is again, why it's so inherently important for the Rockets to try their best to be able to pick up a win against the Brooklyn Nets a little bit later this season, one of their final games of the season. Because if you could force Brooklyn into the lottery, that would be the absolute piece de resistance for this season. So let's go ahead and run this lottery sim before we wrap things up. We've got... Detroit Pistons jumping up two spots to number one. Houston stays put at number two. Orlando falls down to number three. San Antonio at four and OKC at number five. So if I'm Detroit, I mean, any of the top prospects look interesting for Detroit, right? Because they just like, they need all the help that they can get. Um, so I would say, I would say for Detroit, let's send them Palo Bancaro. And then that leaves one of like, like Detroit either takes, you know, Chet or Palo, I think to take a big, um, to put alongside Cade Cunningham. And then I think if you're Houston, right, that leaves you with the choice of Jabari or whoever's left between Palo and, uh, and Chet or, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't see Houston taking Jaden Ivy at one or two. Now, if they're down at three or four, I think that changes the the dynamics a little bit there, especially depending on who's left on the board once they get down to that point. But again, my big board is still, Jabari Smith, one, Chet Holmgren, 2A, Jaden Ivey, 2B, and Paolo Bancaro at three. So that's kind of where my head is at regarding the draft. But be sure to tune in for our next episode. We're going to have uh, Dave Hardesty, Clutch Fans himself, on the program to talk about the state of the Rockets, the direction the organization's headed, thoughts on the rookies, as well as thoughts on the NBA draft and the lottery coming right around the corner. Should they, well, not should they, but you know, just thoughts on the tanking versus you know, winning argument here at the tail end of the season, all this good stuff. Be sure to check, be on the lookout for that episode. But as always, appreciate you for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. Also, be sure to check us out on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. What was your favorite moment from Jalen Green's third 30-point game of his career? Let me know in the YouTube comments. I do read each and every one of those. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.